happening? This is the Tap In Podcast. Um, we are live via Zoom, okay? We're bringing you another episode. Um, I recently got in touch with this gentleman via Instagram. And as everybody knows, I'm a big fan of, of Nipsey Hussle. And then I seen this picture on Instagram and I said, what is this? So I tapped on it and it was a book um, that Nipsey Hussle, his face was on it. And then the title was The Marathon Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nipsey Hussle. And I'm like, hold on, what is this? And then I tapped on a picture and I seen he had a bunch of different rap artists on uh, endorsing the book. And I said, I got to get this guy on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Robert Kenner. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I'm blessed to be tapping in with Tapped In, man. That's right. Appreciate I appreciate, appreciate you, you, man. Yeah. 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 So, so did you get to read the book? Did you mess with the book? Man, like, so <laughs> I'm on, um, I started, I bought the, as soon as I, I, I got the scene, the Instagram post, I went on Amazon and bought the book right away. I'm on uh, chapter nine right now, so I'm almost oh, done okay. with it. Yeah, yeah, I probably had it about a week, so I'm, I'm I'm going through it like crazy. Every time I get a second, I, I at least try to read a chapter or two. Wow, well, I appreciate it. Take your time with it, man. I think speed reading is overrated. I'd rather somebody absorb it than rush through it, you know, but I, I appreciate know. you. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm definitely. The one of the things that um that I really I really needed for me is the the intricate details from the very beginning that I love mm -hmm. that you touch on, um, and in just about him starting and how copy uh what was it Cousy Capone or Copy Capone? Cousy Co Copy Supreme Cousy Capone. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I loved how you were being able to tell that story on how he got started and how he was um he was able to connect with DB, which is Dexter mm -hmm. Brown, yeah. um, from the very beginning. Yeah. How did you get those stories? How did you find that information out? It's interesting that you mentioned and focus on that part of the book because that's, you know, the, they say like half the story has never been told. That, that part of Nip's life has been completely left out of most of the, the stories that have been told about him. And really, I don't, I, the reason I wrote the book is because I didn't feel his life had ever properly been, you know, written about, you know, because he, he was an artist who was very independent, as you know, and he didn't sign to a major label till very late in his career. Um, and so I feel like the, the rap media kind of slept on him. And, you know, when I was at Vibe Magazine, he came up to Vibe very late in Vibe's run like 09 was when I first met him and he, you know, he got his one page in vibe, which was his goal, but we never got a chance to really write the in-depth stories like we would an important artist um, of his stature. So that part of Nip's uh, life, to answer your question, you know, it, it actually came to me. I, I had never heard of Dexter Brown. And when it was announced that I was working on a biography, um, a friend, a mutual friend of his reached out to me and said, you know, there's someone that you really need to talk to um, who was integral in, in Nip's uh, early life. And so I got in touch with Dexter that way. And, you know, he opened up so much knowledge and, you know, in the same way that he schooled uh, Nip to a lot of aspects of the game, he schooled me to a lot of aspects of Nip's life and career. Um, People like Cuzzy I was aware of because he's on the records. And so I reached out to Cuzzy. I reached, you know, this whole book was done not through like industry channels or, you know, management and publicists and people like that. This was just me reaching out to people and doing my job as a journalist and paying attention to music, listening to the interviews. And, and I got, you know, as I mentioned, I met Nip early in his career. Um, and then I also had a chance to interview him in depth around Victory Lap. Um, but, you know, I had to do my job as a journalist. You know, I'm not from South LA. You know, I was born in California, but most of my life I've been in New York. But I was able to reach out to people and, and just approach them out of respect and, 
you know, um, I was covering their story because I thought that they would want to tell their story properly. And, you know, I was very honored by all the people that trusted me enough to, you know, to speak for this book and, and, you know, tell their personal stories. And, you know, I continue to, to follow these artists because I think they're all important artists. People like Cuzzy, Jay Stone, Cobby, you know, Killa Twan, um, Pac-Man, uh, you know, BH. There was a lot of great talents that Nip had identified and, and brought around him. And I'm quite sure if he was still here, he'd be pushing their projects hard. You know, he was, he was very loyal to these artists. And so, you know, I think each of them carries a little piece of that inspiration with them. And, and I, you know, I've continued to support their work and, and pay attention to their movement because, you know, the marathon really doesn't stop. And, um, you know, everybody that had a chance to work closely with him, I think they feel a responsibility to carry the mission forward. It's more than music. It's like a, a mission of self-empowerment and upliftment um, of, you know, your, your inner circle, but your whole community too. And, you know, that's what Hustle stood for. And I think the people that work with him closely have that same ethic. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I reached out to Killer Twan early on, still trying to get him on, uh, still trying to get him on the show. But I think I think uh, Killer Twan is nice as far oh, yeah. as his ability. I think he's nice. And he's actually one of the very first close, like of the artists that, you know, Nip works with, like, as you know, from reading the book, like him and Twan, knew each other from very early school days before they even were aware that each other were doing music. And um, yeah, he told me the story that like when he started hearing this guy Nipsey Hussle, you know, hearing about him, he didn't realize at first that that was Aramis, the guy that he went to school with, you know, or, or, or knew from, from, you know, when, when he was going to school in that neighborhood. So, um, you know, Twan and Nip go way back. And um, he's got some great music coming out right now. He's in the middle of dropping a lot of projects. So, you know, stay on it. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he, you know, he's, he's got some music to, to promote. So I'm sure he wouldn't mind, you know, talking about that, you know. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to tap in with Twan. So before, I, before we dive too far in the book, I want to get your, your backstory. I know you say you started with Vibe. Yeah. How did, how did you um how did you get introduced to hip hop uh, as a culture and how did you even land the job at Vibe? Where yeah, that's a, from? that's a great question. So I moved to New York in the late '80s to um you know with the ambition of being a writer and a journalist. At that time, what I thought I wanted to do was be at Rolling Stone. That was all I knew, like for like music journalism and. You know, I, I did get like one job interview at Rolling Stone, but they were trying to talk to me about like other magazines that they had going on and stuff. And I, I only wanted to do music. They were doing like men's journal and I was like, mm, I'm okay with that. But basically I was, um, I went to college for English. You know, I studied English. So I knew I was a writer. Um, that was always my ambition, but I love music. So I was working in a record shop on weekends I was DJing in clubs, um, you know, and when I, you know, in my day job, I was working at an art magazine. So it wasn't like a music thing, but I was learning about the craft of, of writing and journalism and working with other writers and, you know, just getting my skills up. But then I heard that Quincy Jones was starting a magazine called Vibe. I read about it in a trade magazine called Magazine Week. It's like, you know, I don't know if they still publish it, but at the time that was like how you knew what was going on in the industry. And so I started writing letters to the guy. It, it, it said the name of the editor, this guy, Jonathan Van Meter. And I started writing him a letter every week. I was like, I got to get on with Vibe. And, and my thing at the time, I was into hip hop, but really I was more into reggae and dance hall. That was my passion, you know? And that was the record shop I was working in. It was like a Jamaican music shop. And I would DJ a lot of that music. I knew a lot of artists. And New York has a big Caribbean, you know, culture. So 
in New York, you would see a lot of the artists and, you know, artists, you remember KRS-One just had the verses the other day. Yeah. You know, he, he would, he would always be hanging around the record shop and he shot a video down the block and, you know, his, some of his young protégés, you know, were friends of mine. So it was like a reggae and hip hop were very close at that time, especially in New York and Shinehead, people like that. So anyway, I pitched a story on Supercat, who also just had a versus last week. And Supercat, at that time, had just put out a big album called uh, Don Dada, which some people might remember. He had that Dolly My Baby and, you know, Puffy did an early remix, him and Biggie. So I wrote about Cap for the first issue of Vibe, and they must have liked the story um, because a year later, they just did one test issue in 92. And, you know, a year later when they launched for real, they reached out and offered me a job. So that's, I got down with the startup team of Vibe. Quincy Jones, you know, was changing basically American culture with that magazine like he he had the vision that hip-hop needed a publication like a Rolling Stone for rock and roll you know but for hip-hop and and all forms of you know black music and you know DJ music whether it's R&B dance music reggae and you know so I got on with that super cat piece but I was working on all kinds of uh articles in my job as um, senior editor at Vibe, and I worked with so many amazing writers. And, you know, that time, 93 forward, a lot of things were going on in music, man. It was a very dynamic time in the culture. So we covered, you know, when Nas first put out his Illmatic, and, you know, we did one of the first covers on Snoop, and we did, you know, the first profile of Puffy ever. And, you know, I got to work on all those stories, you know, and, and I ended up being the only editor at Vibe that stayed the whole time. So I was there for 17 years. And in that time I worked on, you know, you can imagine like everyone from Tupac to Barack Obama, you know, we did a lot of things in that magazine. And it's really, to me, like a privilege to be able to work with so many amazing writers and photographers and you know to cover this culture that really changed the world and um you know and like i mentioned it was at the end of the vibe run 2009 was literally the last year before the magazine folded nipsey hustle came in to play his mixtape and that's when i met him okay so vibe i want to go back on vibe because i remember as a kid watching the vibe or getting the magazine, reading the articles, seeing who was on the cover. Like, yeah. I remember that was the Instagram of the time. Um, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, true. it was the Vibe magazine. Man, so were you a part of the, the, the Death Row cover? I worked on every issue of Vibe that ever came out. I was editing the cover stories. I was working with the writers. Of work, you know, I was in the room for every issue of Vibe. So, so yes. Whose whose idea was it to have the the death row cover it all black? Whose idea was that? That was brought by their publicists by Suge. I I think I honestly believe Suge had the idea. Um, but yeah, they they offered to do a cover with Dre. Suge, Pac, and Snoop on one cover. And they specified that they wanted the logo to be red. They definitely said that. And they specified that they were gonna, you know, they suggested that, you know, it'd be presented like the poster of a casino. You know, if you, if you notice that cover is exactly like the movie poster of casino. So that was really something that Death Row brought to us. And we were like, yeah, we're with it. And, you know, we can talk to all these artists. So Kevin Powell, my, my close friend and, you know, colleague over the years at Vibe, he wrote the first cover of Vibe, the Tretch 92 that I wrote my Supercast story in. He wrote the, the next, you know, launch with Snoop. He did that cover. He did so many. He did, you know, he interviewed Tupac numerous times during his career. Um, and so, you know, when... If you look back at the, the Tupac covers, 
you know, he, he did that first one. You might remember when Pac was in a straight jacket. It was called, um, I think it was like, is Tupac crazy? But, you know, that was just the cover line. But inside was that, it was um, like, was, was that the uh, the picture when, when he was in laying in all gold and he had all the gold draped on him in the tub? No, I think oh. that was Rolling Stone ran that. No, this was a this was just an image that um, you know he Pac put on a straight jacket and took a took a photo when the photographer put a straight jacket on him, and that was actually an image that was submitted to us. We didn't do that photo shoot, but when the image came to us, I think it was actually shot for the source originally, mm. and they didn't want to use it, okay. and it was offered to us, and we were like, "Yeah, this is crazy image," because. If you look at Pac's face, he's actually looking very dignified and very, you know, intelligent. He's not looking crazy, but the straight jacket is on him just to show how, in my interpretation, that image really speaks to how society kind of, you know, put the restrictions on him, you know, and treated him like he was crazy. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the death row cover, that concept, I believe, was probably something that Shug dreamed up or, or, you know, his inner circle. And they, they brought that idea to us visually. And, you know, we had the opportunity then to speak with all the people on that cover at a moment when there was, you know, the most important label in the, in the planet, you know, I mean, um, and Kevin went out there. That's a very remarkable article. If you go back and read it today, it's mind blowing. I mean, you know, Think about that moment in time, like Dre is making classics, Snoop and Pac are working together, two of America's most wanted. Suge is like the most powerful and feared person in hip hop industry. And, you know, our reporter was right there, you know, soaking it all up and, you know, like one of a kind situation, man, you know. Yeah. And it's, 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 um, it's fascinating to see how you tied the Nipsey story, him growing up in that era, in and that that era having such an impact on his his musical career as well. Um, it, it, it was it was crazy to see because Nipsey is what a couple of years younger than I am, and so he's I born know, in eighty five. Yeah, born yeah. in eighty five. Yeah, yeah. So he, so I remember I remember those times. Um, but I wasn't in the street at those times. So it probably had a different impact on him than it did on me. Um, how difficult was it to, uh, to write this, this book? Well, I would definitely say it's the most challenging project I've ever taken on. Um, and the most important, I believe also, because like I said earlier, Nipsey Hussle's story was never properly told. Like he gave a lot of interviews on video. Um, he, he, he seemed to talk to just about any video journalist that showed an interest. Like he, he always made time to do interviews in all kinds of platforms, big radio stations and little round the way DVD guys. Like he was, he was speaking directly. He understood and this was something Dexter Brown taught him actually the power of like using video and social media to connect directly to his, his fans. But he didn't do a lot of like magazine profile type pieces. And so like the story hadn't really been laid out. Like, so I thought it was very important as a, you know, a professional music journalist, my, most of my life, I knew what hadn't been done for him. You know, the base, like you say, like his development, tell the whole story not just like a Wikipedia, but really put him in context of American history and LA history and hip hop history, because he was a, he, nobody loved hip hop more than Nipsey Hussle. Like, you know, that's one thing I can say for sure. He loved this art form so much, always aspired to be a rap star, even from a very young age. And, you know, he, he talked about it, like he wanted to be like Criss Cross or, or Bow Wow at one point. And funny enough, the, the record that a lot of people first heard from him was a flip of Criss Cross beat uh, for Jump. You know, Hustle in the House is, is a sample of Criss Cross. So oddly enough, 
that crisscross inspiration came through. Um, but yeah, it was a challenging book to put together, not least because I felt a great responsibility to get it right, you know, and um, I know how important of a figure he is. I believe he's one of the most important and misunderstood artists in hip hop ever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think, I think uh, to, to, and I forget what chapter it was, but you could tell that when Nipsey was evolving, his music life and his street life, like it was like a strain on him being pulled each way and him trying to navigate those street politics, but also he knew that he was evolving, doing something even greater than himself with the music. And so, yeah. and I loved how you, you, you told the history of LA as well. I was, it was things that I didn't even know um, as far as the, the street name, George Crenshaw and Jonathan Slauson yeah, yeah, was a yeah. banker and wasn't, was a real estate. And it was just like, these are the streets that we hold on to and we try to protect with our life when they really have no, uh, we have no ownership of these streets in retrospect. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. I put a lot of LA history into the book because I wanted it to really come through. Like, like one of the things that Nip was so focused on was ownership, right? And, you know, him and his brother were able to actually buy back the block. A lot of people rap about that concept of buy back the block, but they literally purchase the strip mall that they used to get, you know, chased out of for, for hustling. And, and, and it's like such a powerful story to understand that. And, you know, even until now, people that were affiliated with NIP are still, you know, committed to like creating more ownership for the residents of South LA, the, the gentleman, David A. Gross, who helped the financing to, to do that deal on the strip mall, he has a, a fund called Own Our Own. And I think it's important for your audience to be aware of that. They, he's still doing things that are very important. And I encourage people to check out Own Our Own. It's basically a concept called crowdfunding where even if, you know, normally to participate in a big real estate deal, you have to have a lot of cash to, to play in that field. But David A. Gross has put a lot of effort into making it more accessible. So if you want to even just invest $1,000, which is not a small amount of money, but it's a lot less than normally would be required to invest in a big real estate fund. Uh, it is possible to do that through Own Our Own. So I, I encourage people to check that out um, if, if you want to get involved in like ownership and, you know, building generational wealth and all the things that Nip spoke on in his music. It is possible to do. Yeah. How long, how long did it take you to, to write this book? Uh, it was an intense period of about three years, um, basically from the time that you know, I, like the moment I knew I had to write the book was the, the Victory Lab interview, you know? And when I spoke with Nip for over an hour, um, it was such a mind blowing conversation. And, you know, our, our assignment was to make like a five minute YouTube video out of that, you know? And I was like, how are you possibly gonna do justice to this conversation that way? So, you know, that, that video did come out. We, we cut it down and it's a cool video, but I was like, there's so much more that needs to be done here. But in another sense, I, I think I've been preparing for it my whole career. You know, a lot of the things that I learned working in Vibe went into this book. And certainly my first meeting with Nip in 09, you know, that was like 11 years before the book came out, 11, 12 years. So, you know, I've been, working on it in a sense for a long time, but the intense period of putting it together was, you know, about a three year process. Wow. Have you, uh, have you got to spoke, um, have you spoken to uh, Black Sam? Yeah, yeah, he, he, he was interviewed, you know, there's quotes 
from him in the book and also um, uh, Samantha and his sister as well. Yeah, Black Sam doesn't come out a lot. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't, I've been reaching out to a bunch of different people and I haven't had anybody who's, whoever just has direct contact with Black Sam. He seemed like, and I, I, I understand he kind of just wants to just get away and just do his his thing. But, um, I, and one thing that I, I really wanted to know is, I know Nip always talked about how he went to jail and mm. and I always wanted to know like, what was Black Sam doing that he went to jail? Like, what could he have been doing? But finding out from the book, like he was an immaculate hustler, businessman, whatever word you want to put on it. But yeah. Black Sam was a hustler by every sense of the word. And remains so. He's, he's carrying forward that mission, you know, the, the marathon clothing and marathon cultivation. There's so many businesses that Sam is still keeping going. But, you know, he was also a big inspiration to, to Nip and, and, you know, I think had a big influence over him to, you know, keep on the right path in life, you know, because obviously, you know, as you mentioned, like there was a period in, in Nipsey Hussle's career where he was, you know, pulled in two directions and his brother didn't want to see him go the wrong way, you know, and, and he was very clear about that. And, you know, he was showing him a way to make money by hard work and determination. And, you know, I think that that was a big impact. He, he talked about it all the time. There's, there's records. If you go listen to like, um, I don't stress out, you know, that record, he, he says, you know, Black Sam says, poke your chest out, you know, and is those, those words of encouragement and, and not even words, but actions, you know, that, you know, um, Nipsey often said, I prefer demonstration over conversation and Black Sam is a man of action. So I was very privileged and honored that he spoke with me. Um, and yeah, his words are, you know, very powerful in the book. And, um, you know, we've all heard the tribute that he gave at the Staples Center as well. You know, he, he's, he chooses to speak when he chooses to speak. And, you know, it's a great honor to have had a conversation with him. Okay. What other, um, I, I read, I don't know, on the sleeve that you wrote a bunch of different books on um, hip, -hop, hip hop icons. What is it? Um, let me ask you this first. What did you learn? Did you learn anything new um, about Nipsey in, in doing this book? Oh, so, oh, many, so many things. I, I, it was a profound learning experience, the whole process of doing the book. First of all, like I mentioned, the, the whole conversation with Dexter Brown blew my mind and, and understanding, you know, the real journey that, that Aramis Askedome you know, went on, you know, how long he had it in mind to become a successful artist and, and support himself and his family in that way. Um, one of the most mind blowing conversations I had was with um, his, his high school classmate, Rallo Styles, who is a producer that's credited on Victory Lap um, and, you know, many other projects, Crenshaw, you know, he, he made a lot of beats because, you know, he and Nip went to high school together and, uh, you know, worked closely throughout Hustle's career. But when he told me his story of the, the record that they made together, which found its way, this was before he was even named Nipsey Hustle, by the way, he was rapping under the name Concept at the time. And, Concept is on a record with Rallo Styles and another artist from LA. They made this song, which found its way to Afeni Shakur. And Afeni Shakur hears this song <clears throat> and says, she's heard something and said, I need these young men to fly to Atlanta and perform at a record launch event for Tupac, you know, uh, the album Better Days, which was released after Pac's passing, uh, Fanny, you know, actually reached out and, you know, rode in a, in a van 
from the airport to Stone Mountain where the event was gonna be and held a conversation with young Nipsey Hussle. It was like, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You know, like the destiny that connected him to, you know, the, the woman that, you know, was obviously more than just Tupac's mom. She was an icon and the civil rights movement. She was, you know, a member of the Black Panther Party. And, you know, and even in the van ride from the airport, you know, Pac's um, stepfather Matulu calls up from behind bars and is having a conversation with him. Like, you can't make these things up, you know? Um, and then he goes on to say, I'm the Tupac of my generation. There was a lot behind that. And people didn't know until, you know, I was able to have that conversation with Rallo and put it together. And, you know, so when you have an opportunity to tell a story this important, you know, it's a great responsibility to get it right. And that's why I took the time that I did and, and you know, really pushed myself hard to keep digging and keep reaching out to people and learn as much as I could. Cause you know, you could do, you know, you could tell a story, you know, the story is interesting even if you just read his Wikipedia page, right? That's, you know, the facts of Nipsey Hussle's life are amazing. They're like, it's hard to believe that a real person actually lived the life that he lived and accomplished the things he did. It, it sounds like a myth. It sounds like a, a heroic myth from some storybook, but he's a real human being and he really overcame those obstacles and, you know, refused to buckle under the pressure that, that he felt his whole life, you know? So it was important to me to go beyond just what is known on the surface and really show the full depth of this incredible human being. And, and I think the book, you know, I'm, I'm sure this will not be the only book or, you know, project written or produced about NIP, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy that people have read it and, you know, having conversations with people like you, if you're getting something from it, and, you know, the reviews have been great um, to get Quincy Jones to co-sign the project was huge to me. Questlove and Torre and all, the, you know, many of my journalistic peers that have, you know, read the book and given me the thumbs up. It, it means a lot to me, you know, and um, every day in my Instagram, just like we got in touch, you know, people are DMing me their personal experiences of reading the book. People said that they might've read it during a difficult time in their life and got some inspiration or shed a tear or whatever it is, you know, it, it, it means a lot because, you know, writing a book is a marathon and um, it's hard work. And I'm just happy that people have embraced the book and, you know, seem to really like it. And, you know, there, there will be a new edition actually coming out next year, a paperback um, in March. This is the first time I'm talking about it. So a little scoop for you. Um, yeah, it'll be like an updated um, paperback edition coming in March. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, man, it was, this is a great book. Those intricate stories that only the people who were there know it was great. I love the cover of it. The, the cover is, is it almost feels like the, his face is jumping off of the cover. So I love the book. Um, what other books are you working on? Can you, can you give us that? I can't talk about anything. I'm honestly, I, I have a few proposals that I'm working on, but until they're a little more, you know, they're still in the kitchen. So I can't really, you know, put them on the menu yet, but, but, you know, I'm still very focused on, on, you know, getting the word out about the marathon don't stop. And, um, but yeah, I definitely have other, other projects in mind and a couple of proposals that I'm working on right now. You know, I've been a journalist for most of my life. So I have a lot of ideas and stories I like to do. And, and people sometimes hit me up suggesting things that they like to see me do. I, I, you know, like I said before, it was three years intense work to put this book together. So if I choose to, to focus on a project, I have to like basically block out a lot of other things and just go in deep on that. So I'll definitely um, 
you know, do this project justice before I start, you know, focusing on, on another thing. Cause th this one is very important to me. Like I said, it's the hardest and most rewarding thing I've ever tried to do. And, um, you know, I'm very, very humbled by the response that, that I've seen from this book, you know, people really love Nipsey Hussle. And I knew that going in, but I really know it now, like, you know, from, universities to you know people contacting me from behind bars like people in africa people in japan you know england the whole world has tapped in um and we're tapped in right now that's so right. that's yeah. right man well rob thank you so much um everybody go get the book it is available now on amazon.com right yeah, and Barnes and Noble or, or your local bookstore, you know, don't forget mom and pop shop, you know, support right. them, you know, but um, yeah, look, just if you can get your hands on it, um, that hardcover is not going to be any more of them printed. So, you know, if you, if you got that hardcover, you got a first edition. So, you know, that might be a collector's item at some point. So absolutely. I would love to get you to sign this one. Oh, I got you 100%. 100%. Okay. We'll, absolutely we'll figure well, it out so you you're much. you're in dallas right yes sir okay well i don't know when i'm going to be in dallas but if you're in new york we could make that happen or uh you know we could do something in the mail uh, we'll definitely keep in touch though absolutely man robert thank you man i appreciate it. matter of fact i want to ask you this are sure, you related sure. to uh are you related to david kenner no that's funny you ask that <laughs> um i have no relation to david kenner but um there's some other Kenners in the music business too. And uh, as far as I know, I'm not related to any of them. Okay. Um, okay. There's a group that Easy E had, um, HWA, if you know about that group. And two of the girls in that group have the name Kenner. I'm not related to them either. And um, there's a documentary filmmaker named Rob Kenner that's not me, but I also make documentaries. So I don't know. But yeah, David Kenner is an interesting character. Um, I've never spoken with him but um i'm pretty sure we're not we're not family okay all right yeah. well yeah man thank you for tapping in with us rob we appreciate it oh uh, make sure y'all go get the book the book is is a great story um even if, if you're not a fan of nip if you are a fan of nip the details of the story are just fabulous and great and it, it just gives a detailed life of the um of nipsey hustle so I appreciate you, Rob. No doubt. Yeah. I appreciate this conversation. And, you know, I, one more thing I want to tell you, you know, you're a fan and you, you know, the city and, and you understand the, you know, the meaning behind a lot of the details in the book. But one of the things that I'm most happy about is the people that had no idea about this man that have just picked up the book and come away with a greater respect for him and greater understanding of why he is important. And I think that's the reason that I do what I do. It's like to shine a light on people that are not properly respected and appreciated, you know, because obviously a lot of love is there for the hustle, but there's also a lot of people that were completely unaware of his movement. And that's why I wrote the Marathon Don't Stop. And I'm happy that this book is contributing to a greater understanding of why he was important and remains important. Yes, yes. Well, the Marathon Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nissy Hustle is available now when you buy books. Yo, man, thank y'all for tapping in. This has been the Tap In Podcast. All right, much respect.